You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number 173. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, optimal performance, and building a purposeful life and fulfilling career. I'm your host, violinist, and certified performance and life coach for musicians, Dr. René Paul Gauthier. Hi, everyone. I hope this episode finds you having a fantastic day. I'm very excited about today's guest. I bring you the brilliant and thoughtful pianist and composer, Stuart Goodyear. But before I bring him in, I'm curious. Are you feeling stuck? As if you're going through the motions without making real progress? You've put in all the efforts, but you're not seeing results? Or maybe you've hit a career plateau and you're unsure about how to advance towards your dream job. And what about auditions? Have you ever experienced auditions where you thought you were well prepared, but things fell apart? Do you struggle with performance anxiety, negative thoughts, and self-doubt? Does that stop you from delivering your best? I understand the challenges you face. It's frustrating to invest so much effort without seeing the outcomes you seek. We try to work more. We find ourselves practicing repetitively without a clear direction. And the mental game can be tough and discouraging. Preparing for performances requires a different approach than practicing alone. It involves performance training, conditioning methods, and effective mind management to be fully prepared in the right headspace, and ready to perform. So let me ask you, are you currently pursuing auditions or aiming for a significant career milestone in your music? What do you believe it will take for you to deliver a winning audition or secure your dream position and create your ideal musical life? Well, if you're searching for real solutions and guidance to elevate your musical journey, I invite you to join the Music Mastery Experience, my highly personalized and transformative group coaching program. The Music Mastery Experience is the most comprehensive coaching program for musicians available. Together, we're going to identify and overcome the obstacles standing in your way untangling them to create a tailored strategy for you. This is going to empower you to deliver exceptional auditions and confident performances consistently. The Music Mastery Experience is a holistic approach to peak performance. Inside the program, we're going to cover everything you need, effective practicing techniques, performance preparation, and conditioning methods that will revolutionize your performances. You're going to learn repertoire faster and with greater precision using my deep practice model. And you're going to develop mindsets that turbocharge your practice sessions. But that's not everything. You're also going to receive powerful life coaching to support your musical journey and help you achieve your goals. No more wasted time or frustration. The Music Mastery Experience is going to equip you with all the tools and guidance you need to save time, energy, and effort while achieving the results you desire. Visit mindoverfinger.com slash MME right now to learn all the details about the program and schedule a free conversation with me. Together, we're going to plan how to turn your vision into your reality. Get ready to excel in your auditions and propel your musical career to new heights. So book your free call now at mindoverfinger.com slash MME, and I'm eagerly looking forward to speaking with you. And by the way, I'd like to share a message I received from one of the participants in the Music Mastery Experience. She says, I'm living my dream because of the work I did in your program. I truly appreciate your guidance. The tools you introduced me to have had a positive impact on all aspects of my life. I use your foundation every day and enthusiastically recommend your course to others. You helped me completely change my life. Let me tell you, as you're listening to this, this kind of transformation is within your reach. So let's connect and strategize to make this a reality for you. 
Again, it's at mindoverfinger.com slash me to book your free conversation with me and find more information. And all the details and the links are in the show notes. I can't wait to talk with you. Okay, let's dive into this week's conversation. Stuart Goodyear is a world-renowned concert pianist, improviser, and composer. He was proclaimed a phenomenon by the LA Times and one of the best pianists of his generation by the Philadelphia Inquirer. Stewart has performed with and has been commissioned by many of the major orchestras and chamber music organizations around the world. The recording of his suite for piano and orchestra and his piano sonata were released by Orchid Classics last year, and his recent commissions include a piano quintet for the Penderecki String Quartet and a piano work for the Honens Piano Competition. Stewart has an impressive discography, including the complete sonatas and piano concertos of Beethoven, as well as concertos by Tchaikovsky, Hale Stork, Grieg, and Rachmaninoff, an album of Ravel piano works, and an album entitled For Glenn Gould. His Rachmaninoff recording received a Juno nomination for Best Classical Album for Soloist and Large Ensemble Accompaniment, and his recording of his own transcription of Tchaikovsky's The Nutcracker was chosen by the New York Times as one of the best classical music recordings. Stewart has a busy 23-24 season, and some of the highlights include performances at summer for the city at the Lincoln Center, the South Bank Center in the UK, the Schleswig-Holstein Festival, a recital debut at Wigmore Hall, his debut with the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, and his return with the Milwaukee Symphony, Buffalo Philharmonic, Philadelphia Chamber Music Society, and a Carnegie Hall debut with the Royal Conservatory Orchestra. This was a fascinating conversation about music making that will take you beyond the nitty-gritty of practicing and invite you into a universe of creativity and personal musical exploration. Stewart's wisdom really sparked a profound reflection for me, and I know you're going to walk away inspired. Let's go to the show. Stuart Goodyear, it's so great to have you on the show today. Such a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's good to talk to you. Stuart, you and I have known each other for many years. If I can get my hand on the picture of this recital we played together, I think may maybe, like we shouldn't oh. say, maybe 35 years ago or yeah, so. Yeah, somewhere um, like I might post that on social media, but um, <laughs> I... I'm so excited that we have this chance to take a deep dive and talk a little bit more about your wonderful career, but also your process, both as a performer and a composer. Certainly. So can we begin there? Please tell the audience about you and your path on this musical journey. Well, it started when I was um, three or four years old and um, music was a part of my life from the very beginning. It was just my heartbeat and love listening to any kind of music from pop to classical to jazz. My dad left a legacy of LPs. He died a month before I was born of cancer, but I got to mm -hmm. know him through his LP collection. And so he had um, LPs like The Beatles, Led Zeppelin and um, Ravi Shankar, as well as two boxes of um, symphonies of Beethoven and Tchaikovsky. And um, it, it were those box sets that um, really um, started my quest to be a musician, and um, it's still, uh, thankfully, still going. Yes. Stuart, you have this, I don't know if it's a habit by now, but this habit of playing these marathon concerts where you play the entire, you know, the cycle of Beethoven sonatas. One of the questions I get the most often from listeners, they're really fascinated about artists' practice processes and also memorization processes. So I would love for you to maybe dive into this topic with us a little bit. Talk to us a little bit about this practicing process that you have and also how does it work for you to memorize music? Um, so I memorize pieces quite quickly because um, I just put myself into a state where um, I'm just very, very relaxed and I'm looking at pieces in a whole. And I guess 
with every piece I look at the storyline. I I think if I was not a musician, I would have been, I would have loved to have been a film director because I'm just fascinated by how people tell stories, timing, what frames they use, what devices that they use, and similarly how what devices composers use in order to tell their story. I recently um, um, learned a Liszt's Sonata, which is a work that um, for pianists, they start quite early, like teenagers, learning this. And I had this rebellion where I'm thinking to myself, my gosh, I heard this piece so many times. I just, you know, if I got it out of my um, ears for a little while and learned something else, and that happened for maybe, you know, a a long time. And then finally, um, but yeah, with the Liszt Sonata, it was the same kind of practice where, you know, I was looking at it and thinking to myself, all right, what is this piece about for me? And how does Liszt tell a story from my ears and how am I going to approach it from a very personal point of view and then start Mm -hmm. from there? And then the practice begins where every two pages I'm going back and then playing those two pages and then adding another page and adding another page and, you know, working on different lines, but at the same time working on the structure as well. And that's part of... um, the process of memorizing pieces quite quickly, as well as um, um, developing muscle memory. Mm. So the musical process, the interpretation, the story you're trying to say is integral to the learning process itself. Exactly. Oh, I love that. This is great. You talk about being in the state of relaxation. And it's so interesting because not a whole lot of people would associate practicing with being in a state of relaxation. I want to hear more about this. Okay. Yeah, I guess it is a discipline and it's definitely something that one has to cultivate, you know, just that level of relaxation because a lot of the music is so intense. And if you're too intense, your body kind of freezes up. I know for me, I develop bad habits if I'm not relaxed. I'm constantly fretting about getting a, a getting a um, a passage right, or trying to learn, uh, or trying to create a deadline for memorizing the piece. And um, you know, it's not healthy for me, and it's I think it's the the the, uh, the worst way to go about it. Mm-hmm. Even when it comes to um, performing, it's something where I'm thinking to myself, "All right, I'm not going to think about." notes i'm not going to think about passages because that work is already done all i'm going to think about is telling that story to um, the listeners of that moment and we're all in this together we're all on that journey together and so that's and and having that mindset relaxes me too Mm. thank you for saying this that it's a state that we cultivate because some people think that it's something you either have or do not have oh yeah yeah What are some ways that, you know, someone who's maybe aiming to get into a relaxed state like this, what are some things that you think they could try? Try their favorite movie. Like, you know, try a movie that they, you know, everyone has a movie that is their favorite and they know every single line of. It could be an Adam Sandler movie. It could be an Ingrid Bergman movie. It could be The Princess Bride. It could be Scarface. No matter what that movie is, have that internalized and what was it about that movie that made you watch it over and over and over again? And what were the um, memory exercises that one had to know every single line? (laughs) And it's all about the enjoyment of watching as it is to me, like the enjoyment of learning a work and listening to a work. That's part of what makes it such a joy to learn and to internalize pieces of music. I love in what you're saying that you keep mentioning the word joy which is for me in the work that I do as a coach, such a big thing. And in as much as we want to take our craft seriously, we also don't want to take ourselves seriously. So for me, it's really wonderful that you bring that element of joy in this context of, you know, of practicing, of preparing for performance. And I remember this from, you know, we've known each other for a long time and uh, watching you perform back in the days at the at the CMC is that you really did seem to enjoy yourself and and you seemed very absorbed in the music. Yeah. Yeah, 
because even from a from a young age, you know, that was my um, that was my breath, that was my heartbeat, you know, and that you know, and that was something that I loved to do was listen to music, and it was just such a part of my life. It was like I was um, sharing my life with people. Yeah, even, even from um, even if it was um, from a competition, it was still you know a matter of you know I'm playing for the judges, I'm playing for whoever is listening. As you know, I'm even playing for um, the people who I'm competing with. I was not even thinking about it, you know, of course I wanted to win, but mm-hmm. uh, I wasn't thinking about it as competing against someone. Right. More about competing with somebody and, you know, and seeing what they brought to the table. And then from there, really learn about what they did, how they made music and really share what I would do as well. So I think there was more sharing than it was about, all right, let's see how I'm going to better you. Oh, that's wonderful. And as I hear you speak as a mother myself with young children, I think it's so wonderful that it appears that whoever was working with you, your teachers and your mother did a fantastic job in in cultivating this in you. What do you advise? You know, what advice would you give to parents or teachers to support their child or their students in this way so that that child does not lose this joy uh, or approaches music making with such a healthy mindset as what you're talking about right now? I think ask the kids who their idols are. Mm. Ask the kids what got them into this world. You know, for kids who want to be in sports, who want to be in music, who want to be in any kind of practice, there was someone or something that got them to that, you know, to that place where they're just hungry to be a part of that world. And to have the parents be a part of it with them, Mm -hmm. I think if, you know, from there, they'll they'll know exactly what to do, you know, especially when they know exactly who their kids are, what they dream about and who their idols are it makes it almost natural to mold them. And it's not about drilling. It's about, you know, motivation and about inspiring them to really strive for whatever they want to strive for. Right. Would you describe yourself as someone who is self-motivated in the practice room as a kid? Oh, yeah. 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 So it was a matter of keeping you inspired and not forcing you to sit in there for a given number of hours every day. Yeah. Well, I wasn't thinking about it as like, I have to have this amount of hours. It's really about, all right, as long as it takes or as short as it takes, I'm going to get this passage to my liking. I'm going to reach a pinnacle that I feel worthy of this work, worthy of this piece that I really, really adore. And it's all about not thinking about how many hours did I spend. It's like, did I get it? Did I yeah. achieve what I wanted to achieve? Truly a labor of love. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. That brings me to another thing I wanted to talk to you about outside of your career in recorder, as I understand, <laughs> as a recorder <laughs> player, yeah. um, is that aspect of composition. because. I remember as a child, you were already composing and let's hear about this, how this was, you know, I'm guessing hearing you speaking about this love and um, inner enthusiasm that you had for it, did the composition process just sort of, you know, come about on its own? Well, it it did start to me. I didn't think of... um my passion for being a pianist and my passion for being a composer are separate. I just felt like, you know, um, the idols that I admired had both passions in their lives. And, you know, even, you know, past composers that, you know, that were not alive, but I, you know, what, what they, you know, what they created and what motivated them and what inspired them, like Beethoven, like Rachmaninoff, like Clara Schumann, who balanced both um, composing and being a, you know, one, one of the, uh, first touring stars that we have and how she combined that as well as being a mother with many, many children and what she did, what was her discipline and how, what was the balance Mm. 
to keep that all together was something that really, I don't think it has been that successful, successfully duplicated. You know, she, she was quite a force. Yeah. And how does that look like right now? You talk about discipline and balance. You have a very busy career and I'm seeing that there are some wonderful uh, performances of your works. How does that look like right now? Well, that's a good question. It's still, <laughs> like, like for, you know, for uh, composition, it's been, um, it's a labor of love, but it's another discipline altogether because it's really, um, it makes the days even longer because, you know, in the practice room, I am so much in the sound world of the composer that I am interpreting. Mm -hmm. But as a composer, you have to get out of that sound world and you have to really be inspired by the outdoors and by all kinds of different environments. So having that kind of discipline and um, knowing how to balance both, you know, both worlds from, you know, from a studio and from the outside is, you know, it's definitely um, something that is very important to me. And it's definitely a balance that, you know, I'm still, I'm still trying to wrestle with, but it's, um, it's a part of what makes me tick as a composer, um, you know, just hearing the heartbeat of, you know, of the present and mm -hmm. every piece that I've written has that. I love that expression of sound world. Yeah. What is that? I don't know if this is something that can be put into world into words, but what does your sound world feel like for you? Um. Or is that too personal of a question? No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely share. Um, a lot of my work. Um, goes back to my childhood um, mm -hmm. because it was such a period of absolute optimism. Not like I'm not optimistic now, but mm -hmm. there was a childlike optimism and a restlessness and a curiosity where you just want to know everything, smell everything, experience everything, see everyone. And, you know, as a kid, you're so wide eyed and, you know, you're not, you're, you're not concerned about the social graces. If you're really amazed by something, you point and kind of internalizing that and saying, and, and you know, from a, you know, from a pointing uh, standpoint thinking, all right, what would I be pointing to if, what, while I'm creating this? What would be um, something that um, a five-year-old me would really be um excited by and mm -hmm. um it's a rule that i always every it, with, with every piece i write if it's a slow one or if, a, a slow movement of some sort or a very busy one it's, a, it's always a matter of all right you know as a, as a five-year-old me what would make me tick mm -hmm. that's like, incredible that's incredible and to again as a mother i think that It's such a testament to the type of environment your mother was able to provide for you that you can say those things about your childhood. It's quite yeah. touching. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, sorry, I feel like I'm taking you from one topic to the next. <laughs> um, it, there's so many things that you say that make me think of um, others, other topics. I wish we had hours to cover one again going back to this discipline and balance that you you talked about um clara schumann being a really busy touring artist and you are yourself a busy touring artist right now i think the listeners would be really curious to hear a little bit about what uh what that entails in terms of negotiating a lot of repertoire traveling performing multiple programs and composing as well What does that look like in terms of, um, you know, let's say taking a piece from point zero to performing while juggling a lot of yeah. other projects? Tell us a little bit about how you negotiate this and maintain somewhat <laughs> some balance. Yeah, it's busy. It's busy and it's um, I'm, I'm self-managed. So, you know, mm. not only am I a composer, not only am I a pianist, I'm also... Um, a self-manager 
And wearing those many hats requires a lot of time and also, again, a lot of discipline. So it's like, you know, I devote myself to this, you know, to, you know, the management side, get, you know, get my emails done, make sure that traveling and lodging and all this kind of thing is squared away. So once I'm there, all I'm thinking about is the concert that I'm going to be doing and the concert that I have, you know, the next time. And then once I'm there, I also want to take into this, you know, uh, take in the sites, you know, um, you know, I love revisiting cities and, you know, reconnecting with friends of mine and going out for dinner, going out for coffee and, you know, having that a part of my life. And then after that, when I'm in the hotel, there's not much to do in the hotel anyways. You're basically in a room. So it's perfect. So it's, it's, it's a great opportunity to um, compose, be inspired um, by the company that you had spend time with and, you know, you do some writing and then there's, there's, there's the dressing room where I go through the pieces that I'm going to be performing for that city as well as thinking about, all right, the next thing, what do I have? And um, yeah, it's like ongoing, ongoing, ongoing. Mm. And what about coming back full circle, the focus to practice and learn repertoire so fast. I know that you talked about that state of relaxation and something that you said about memorization makes me think that maybe pattern recognition is something that is pattern prominent. Yes. Yeah. How do you, because my whole thing is like mindful practice, you know, mindset, all these things. Yeah. Um, what helps you maximize your time in the practice room? I think exactly what you said. It's all about patterns and it's all about what ideas come back. And it's mm. back to the storytelling where, you know, with storytelling, with every screenplay um, that I, I love uh, reading screenplays to movies that I've watched and mm -hmm. I love reading plays, um, you know, even ad uh, adaptations to plays that, are, that have been made into movies that I, I think are quite revealing because they focus on one word a lot. Mm -hmm. when, it comes, when it comes to screenplays, or so there is a theme that they always come back to with every, you know, with, with um, um, The Princess Bride, it depends on what that is. It could be revenge. It could be true love. And the lines that have been so iconic and immortal, a lot of that has to do with what themes come back. And it makes it... Um, such a joy to um, remember those lines. And it makes it easy to remember those lines because you have such a connection with the context of where those lines come from. And I think that's another thing about um, pieces like um, this Liszt Sonata. It is, a, you know, one, one thing that made it, um, okay, I'm going to say this, what made it easy to learn? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, there are a lot of notes, but I think what made it easy to learn was the fact of looking at it from a storytelling standpoint, because Liszt gives a lot and there are themes that come back and he layers out the storyline beautifully. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a work that's half an hour and, you know, there are no breaks. So it is really a story and, and it captures your attention because of exactly how Liszt plates, uh, places the plot lines. Mm -hmm. That's really fascinating. And as I hear you speak, I think I, you know, probably am inspired in, not inspired, but also, um, what is the word in English? This is where being a French speaker can be hard at times. <laughs> and when you're holding interviews in English, um, influenced is the word that I was yeah. looking for by um, also the solo episodes that I've been creating lately on the podcast, which were all about mastery. And the, the latest one that came out is about um, introspection and self-exploration. So I think as I hear you speak, I'm also fascinated by how your process is so unique to you and you have really figured out a way that works for you, probably a combination of who you are, um, you know, all the, the conditioning that you've had throughout the years, your knowledge, your personality, all of this. And it just makes me want to say how oftentimes so many musicians are looking for the recipe and yeah. like I should say the recipe with like quotation marks when if we give ourselves permission to just explore mm -hmm. and do a lot of self-exploration and introspection, 
we can come up with something completely different for ourselves. And for me, it looks like you have absolute, um, you, you really have created your own way of operating. You know, you talked about sound world earlier, and it looks like you've also created um, an artistic process world that is truly unique to you and works. And I think that's what we should all aim to do is really explore give ourselves permission to just dig in for the answers instead of looking for processes out there. Right. Yeah. I love this approach that you're talking about that seems to be coming so much from, you know, the, and you know, you can always tell me if I'm getting this wrong, but <laughs> that comes from your storyline of the piece, your vision, your artistic inspiration and then you find the technical tricks to make it all come together. <laughs> yeah. And, we, you know, like technique, you know, it's really a, a lot of it, you know, is um, that it's the muscle memory. It's the muscle memory of, you know, of knowing your body so intricately that you know exactly what the spots are, what to work on. You know, just like an athlete, what muscles will do, um, you know, what, what you want your body to do. What is that muscle that enhances that part of the body, that kind of mindset, that heartbeat, that endurance, you know, um, athletes, you know, have it down pack as, as uh, to how much time is needed on each muscle. And, you know, with musicians, with violin, with clarinet, with, you know, with breathing and all of those things, all of that technique is, you know, it's a, it's a part of it. And it's about of, all right, what are you working on? How are you going to work on that passage? So you get the, um, you know, the ultimate, success and right. you know it's uh it's, it's it's just part of the um it's part of the fun it, you know practicing it's interesting calling practicing fun but once you it, it, you know it's like <laughs> sorry mary poppins but i'm gonna steal your um quote you know you find the fun and the jo and the job's a game yeah and, and um you know with practicing when, when you know when you when you find that element of what is it that makes you tick you know you you don't you're not even relying on time as as about to all right how are you going to get this right how are you going to get this game um, winning? Yeah. Oh, I love this. I mean, I held three joyful practice challenge for that very purpose. Is where is the fun? Yeah. And you know how can we bring play back in playing the instrument? So, right. how about a quick round of rapid fire question before I let you go today? Okay, certainly. And you think I would know? All of the questions by memory by now after five seasons, but you know what? I'm just going to pull my list here anyway. <laughs> um, well, you know, let's just stay in the same line of thought. And what makes practicing more enjoyable for you? Um, what makes it enjoyable is um, hearing the audience's response to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I don't know about, you know, athletes. I would love to talk to more athletes, um, you know, when, when, it, when it comes to, you know, shooting that... Um, hoop or you know scoring that goal what are they thinking of mm -hmm. what is that exhilaration where does that come from and what exhilarates them is it the cheer is it the goal itself is it the fact that um there is just that give and take that goes on is it a combination of all three or four um and it's always very very different with, with every piece that i write you know it's it's the same discipline but it's always something that constantly surprises me and you know the element of fun is so different for each piece right oh this is great what is a habit that you have that you think contributed to your success uh oh that's a good question <laughs> that's a good question hopefully whatever it is is going to keep me is going to keep me going <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Or maybe what what is the quality that you think you have that contributed to to your success? Honestly, it, you know, what's success to me is reaching that listener mm -hmm. so completely. And um, that, you know, the, uh, the listener is giving, uh, you know, giving to me as much as what I'm giving to them. That's what makes it um, makes a successful performance. It's like we're all in tune with each other. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Do you have a favorite tool in the practice room? A favorite tool? 
Uh, stretching. Yeah, I really like that. About a performance that has stayed with you, the particular significance for you throughout the years, what comes up for you? Well, there's a bunch. Um, Herbert Blumstead conducted uh, Beethoven's Egmont Overture. It was, um, you know, there were kind of, when I was, uh, when I was a New Yorker, I was going to Carnegie Hall a lot and checking out programs, but the top performance to me, what stayed with me was Herbert Blumstead doing the Egmont Overture as an encore. And it was so, it was, it was the feeling that I had listening to that performance was so powerful and words just couldn't do justice to how I felt, but it did change my life. And it was the beginning of how I ended up on a quest of doing all of the sonatas in one day. Mm. I love hearing that story. That's, that's very fantastic. Um, let's see. What's a piece of advice that you would give to the listeners there's no wrong way of listening and there's no one way of uh, wrong way of responding if you're if what you feel is true whatever the music is saying to you is saying something very powerful and embrace it mm. that's beautiful stuart i like to ask each guests um to give an actionable tip that the listeners could apply in their practice or their performing or their musical journey, what would you offer to them as an actionable tip? A tip? Uh, when you go in, you know, when you go into the practice room, just, you know, uh, sit down, take a deep breath. And I think uh, be in a state of relaxation. You could do anything. You could almost be very, very goofy. Look at yourself in the mirror, you know, and make sure that you're not taking yourself too seriously by probably um, coming up with the most ridiculous facial expression ever. <laughs> and then after that, putting, you know, relaxing you that way. And then you're already in the mindset of, you know, whatever goes, whatever happens, it's all a part of that journey. And yeah. You're you're always surprising yourselves, and um, you know with every piece, it's never the same old, same old. So it's something that it's not. It is a routine. It is a discipline, but at the same time, it is not a chore if it's done right. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Is there anything that we didn't? I mean, there are many things we didn't touch on today for sure. But anything in particular that you? would love to have the opportunity to share with the listeners, either about you or about music. No, you, you, you'll just have to invite me back again for another <laughs> hour and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let it rip. That sounds great. Can, uh, please tell us a little bit about the multiple ways that maybe we can catch you live. There's a few coming up in Chicago, so I'm very excited yeah. about that, but what's coming up for you in the next few months? And I will I should have said this before. I will invite the listeners. I'm going to put all these links in the show notes, of course. Um, you have a fantastic YouTube channel. There's some really great videos of your performances out there. And your website has all of your dates. Um, but anything coming up in particular that uh, you're very excited about? I'm really excited about Chicago. I'm, I'm doing Grand Park coming up. And it's a uh, work. Um, speaking about um, Sound World, um, I love the story behind this work that I'm going to be um, performing with the orchestra. It's um, a work that Sanson wrote in three weeks. Mm. And imagine that kind of discipline and that kind of amount of, uh, that, that drive and whatever the mindset was in order for him to um, write a 20 minute work in a few weeks and then perform it you know, just almost immediately after. So Sanson and Antoine Rubinstein, who was this piano superstar, Sanson accompanied, um, well, was at the podium when Anton did his um, his own concerto. He was a soloist. And so, you know, just right at the spur of the moment, I don't know if it was, uh, you know, um, after one drink or many or whatever happened or <laughs> just, just the high that they have after that successful performance. Like, let's trade places. And... I, Anton, will be on the podium, and you, Camille Sasson, will be um, the soloist. 
And Sasso was saying, okay, great. Let me write a piece that I've never played before for the occasion. And so, you know, just that amount of craziness, ingenuity, and, you know, almost like a rabbit trick. Mm -hmm. And what the result of that was. And there was absolutely no time to think, absolutely no time to second guess. Everything was about, all right, what makes you check right at that second? Mm-hmm. Almost similarly to what uh, what Gershwin had to do, you know, putting a ra- uh, pulling a rabbit out of that hat was, you know, to write a work that was going to be premiered maybe, maybe two or three weeks afterwards, as soon as he got the notice, oh, wait, I have to write a work for piano and orchestra. And everything was the spur of the moment, no second guessing, letting the ride take you there and having that job be a game. And it, what a game it is that that work never ceases to delight, enchant, and is going to, if I do it well, it's going to knock people's socks off. So that's mm-hmm. my assignment for um, for my concert in Chicago, that I do justice to Sanson, um, hopefully get as wild a response as possible because Sanson's worth it. Mm-hmm. And we know you will. Stuart, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing this wisdom with us. I feel like it's a real invitation for all of us to give ourselves permission to explore and ask ourselves questions and just let our imagination wild. So I want to thank you for that. My pleasure. Thanks so much. This was such a pleasure. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Mind Over Finger podcast. If this content was helpful for you, please share with everyone you think could benefit from it. Take a screenshot, share on social media, and tag me. I'm Mind Over Finger everywhere. So reach out, send me a DM, and let me know how this content helped you. Let's keep the conversation going. As always, I have all the information related to this episode in the show notes. You can find them via your podcast app or by visiting mindoverfinger.com, where you can also find more free resources on efficient practice and performance preparation, links to sign up to my free workshops, and information on how to work with me. Don't forget to sign up for my newsletter to receive your free guide to a productive mindful practice transcripts from the Mind Over Finger podcast episodes delivered to your inbox every week, and more. Also, join the Mind Over Finger Facebook community, my private group, for access to my live videos and to exchange with a community of like-minded musicians. So make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. And if you have specific questions for me or my guests that you would like answered in an episode, share them with me using the link in the show notes or send me a DM on Instagram or Facebook. That's it for today. Again, thank you and à bientôt.